I urge you all, um, I don't know if you knew this, but Patricia is a very visual learner and um, really appreciates uh, drawing diagrams. And so if you have any questions from past homework about uh, anything visual in nature, do go to Patricia. Um, her office hours are next Tuesday. Um, so as I'll end in this lecture, um, do appeal to this visual side of her. She, uh, she really truly is a visual learner. Um, I, I did want to say, um, that um so today is the last day of probability monday um we're going to do a lightning review of sort of the entire course and um i would just like to give you a bunch of sample problems and we'll sort of categorize them so i want to um consider this entire course as sort of a a cabinet with different little slots and each problem will just sort of go in a cabinet. And that's the way I want you to think about the SAT test. So you have an algebra problem or a geometry problem and, and these things go in their respective slots and you can sort of work um, thematically. So Monday will be a lightning review. Tuesday will be some more fun with graphing as requested. I know we had lots of interest in people um, wanting to do some more graphing, 3D graphs, polar graphs. Wednesday, so, so Tuesday will be the last day. Uh, Wednesday, will be devoted to um, calculus for the juniors and seniors. So ninth and 10th graders, you do not need to attend uh, Wednesday, Thursday. Juniors and seniors, I ask that you attend. There will still be quizzes uh, Wednesday, Thursday for the juniors and seniors. So it'll be a lot of fun, uh, lots to still look forward to. Uh, just a reminder that your homework is due uh, this Friday. That's the final homework assignment, homework eight uh, at 9 p.m. Okay, thanks a lot, Patricia, for letting me interject and uh, enjoy the enjoy the lecture. Awesome, thank you, uh, Tarag. Um, let me see if I can. Okay, perfect. Um, and I am recording. Okay. Uh, today we're going to be doing more probability problems, so get excited. Um, I think that yesterday we got a really good uh, foundation and especially those marble problems you seem to have a really a really good feel for um what to do in those problems but then it got a little bit trickier when we started looking at word problems and some of those where we were like finishing at the tables or doing multiple choice so i just pulled a bunch of sample problems from online that will hopefully we can walk through them together and they're all different which is part of what makes probability either exciting or really challenging depending on um, how you feel about that but really we'll just be walking through a bunch of sample problems today that's sort of the goal so before we began begin i want to just reiterate some of the things i was talking about yesterday so my three big tips for probability is before you start a problem, make a logical prediction. So we were making some logical predictions with that one through five activity. So before even going into a problem, you should know if it's going to be really big, really small, about 50-50. Um, so that's just a good first step. Take your time, which I know is not always possible in the SAT, but the good news is that we're not, um, you know, taking the SAT in this exact moment. So in all of these problems, we can really take our time, process them, think slowly, because word problems trick you up when they throw in extra details. So, you know, the slower that we go, the more patient we are, the more likely we'll do things correctly. Um, and hopefully developing those skills will make you more confident and be able to maneuver through them more quickly. But for now, just really taking our time. And then as always, I get excited about probability because for people who think that they're bad at math or people who think that you know, they're not good with numbers, probability definitely has to do with numbers and definitely is math, but it's a different type of math. And for a lot of people, it's more logically based. So some people really enjoy that. So um, I'm looking forward to doing these problems. I thought, it would be useful to sort of start with this problem from the homework because I think that this one was pretty tricky. I don't know if anyone else felt that way and sort of felt betrayed, or this wasn't in the homework, this is in the quiz yesterday, and felt betrayed that all of a sudden, like you were following things in class and then there was this really tricky problem. So um, 
I thought it would be useful to sort of go through this together. Um, so there is a mathematical way to think about this. Um, but first I wanna sort of think about it just more logically so that if you get a problem like this, you blank on math or formulas, you can still think your way through it during the SAT or during another thing. Um, so this is asking, we're flipping a coin twice. So we're gonna have some coin that'll have some head or some tails on it. And then we're doing that twice. Oh, oh my. Um, and the question is, what are the odds that we get heads at least once? So for me, logically, I think that it makes sense since there's only two coins, we can sort of think through it, um, just thinking about all the possibilities. So what are the possibilities for this first coin to be? It could either be heads or it could be tails. And then for the second one, it could also be heads or it could be tails. And as Tarag said, I'm a visual learner. So it's useful for me to sort of write it out because now I can imagine all of the possibilities. One possibility is we could have heads, heads. A possibility is we could have heads, tails. A possibility is we could have tails, heads. And a possibility could be tails, tails. So by writing out my possibilities, I was able to sort of plot out all of the possibilities. And all of these, these four things, are all equally likely to happen. So now the question is, what's the probability of getting heads at least once? So here, this, oh my, um, this guy works, right? We have heads, heads here, heads, tails here, tails, heads here. All of those have heads at least once. So the correct answer for this one is three fourths. And if you got that wrong in the quiz yesterday, do not stress out or be worried because um, it was a little bit trickier than some of the ones we were thinking about. So again, there is a way to sort of mathematically actually think our way through this and that involves um, doing something called a summation um, and sort of taking like the probability of the first time and then adding um, this like more extreme probability and um, it's useful, but I think that it's, um, I think that it's useful, but maybe um, trickier than um, is needed depending on what level of math you have. So um, some of you guys might be ready for that, but more generally drawing things out, thinking through it slowly, not letting yourself get super flustered by a question like this and instead saying like okay what do we know about coins we have two coins let's try to draw a picture let's try to do something that's a good place to start okay now for some new problems i like this one because it calls back some of our geometry knowledge so this figure is made up of one circle inside of another what is the probability that a point picked at random will be in the shaded region? So we talked about probability yesterday is the like likelihood of some specific event happening from all of the possible events or something more general. So in this case, I'm thinking this like gray is our specific and then the general is like this much larger, oh wow, I'm struggling with the pen today, um, the like larger circle. So does anyone remember what the area of a circle is and can put that in either the chat or can unmute themselves to remind me? Pi r squared, does that ring a bell for people? Kind of ring a bell? And then we have circle. Yeah. Okay, it does, good, good. Um, circumference, we don't need it for this problem, but maybe that's just a good reminder. Does someone remember what circumference is? Our formula for this like outside perimeter? Two pi r. Perfect. 
Um, so again, circumference not super relevant for this problem, but just a good reminder. So we want to start by figuring out um, the area of the gray and then sort of dividing it by the larger circle area. And that's how we're going to go about this problem. So we have pi r squared, and we want that to be, like I'll call this r. And then if we're going to divide it by the area of this larger circle, and I'll call this maybe like capital R, just to sort of distinguish them. Um, pi r squared. So we have the area of this little teeny circle, and we're dividing it by the area of this really big circle. So we have a 6 for this guy. 36. Oh my. 36 pi. And we're trying to divide that by whatever um, the radius is for this big circle. So what is the radius for this big circle? Is it 6? Is it 4? Is it something else? Someone want to put it in the chat or unmute yourself? So this total length is going to be 10. Um, and I'm doing that by adding up the six and the four together. And if that didn't come to you naturally, you can sort of think like if you ended up doing r squared as four, you'd get 16 pi and you'd be like, wait a second, there shouldn't be a greater than 100% chance that you're landing in this gray circle. So that's where you sort of use your making a logical prediction. Um, so you're like, oh, little red flag going up. So instead it's 10, so we have 100, pi, 10 times 10, pi. We can cancel out our pi's and we can write this as a fraction. We can write it as a decimal. We can write it as, oh, that can be even simplified even further, um, as a percentage. All of these are correct ways of thinking about this. And we can take a pause and sort of like think about it logically. Does this look like maybe about a third of the area. I mean, don't like totally buy into it, right? Because this isn't drawn to scale. But if you sort of imagine a circle, I would buy that. It's not absurdly small. It's not absurdly large. Sorry, did someone want to say something? Okay, no worries. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't cutting anyone off. Um, as I'm moving through these, if you guys have any questions, feel free to flag me down, tell me to move more slowly, um, and I'd be happy to do so. Okay, this next one. 25 people were asked to name their favorite baseball team. Eight answered New York Yankees, seven answered Atlanta Braves, five answered Chicago Cubs, and five answered San Francisco Giants. So what is the probability that a person chosen at random has the Atlanta Braves or San Francisco Giants as their team, as their favorite team? So I'm reading this immediately, my brain is like, or, that's one of our either or. And if you remember, either or, we add up the probabilities. Like um, an example from that marble bag would be like, what's the probability that you grab blue or red? And we took the blue probability and added it to the red probability and got this combined larger probability. So our logical prediction is that our answer to this problem should be greater than the probability of just Atlanta Braves and greater than the probability of just San Francisco Giants. So we need a specific over a general. What's the... Um, it, mm -hmm. uh, 12 over 25? 12, oh, I see 12 over 25, multiple people are saying that, yeah. So we have Atlanta Braves, we have seven over 25, and then for San Francisco Giants, we have five out of 25, perfect. So thank you guys for chiming in and participating. That's exactly what I want this to be, so that's perfect, exactly. So 12 out of 25, we could also write that as 0.48 or 48%, but all of those are correct ways. So you guys crushed that one. You don't even need me here for that one. So you guys seem to feel confident about that. Um, 
This is a good one. How many computer passwords can be created with three digits followed by three letters if the first number cannot be zero and no number or letter can be repeated? Okay. So we're dealing with a sequence of events here. And I don't know if you guys remember, but sequence of events, we um, are multiplying. And this isn't even asking for the probability of something. This is just asking how many. So we're still multiplying, but it's not going to look like a fraction. Um, so if you're trying to wrap your head around this, let's start by drawing a picture, thinking about it visually. Um, so we're going to have some password that has three digits. So these have to be numbers. And then we're going to have three letters. And the first number cannot be zero. So I'll just like anti-zero. <laughs> um, so the way to think about this is we're going to multiply all of the possibilities. So this first number can't be zero. How many other digits are there possibilities? So all of our digits are zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, 10 is no longer a digit, that's like a two digit number. So we're looking at just these. The first one can't be zero. So our options are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine. Okay, someone's suggesting 30 different combinations. We'll keep that in mind and sort of see as we keep going through this one. So we have nine possibilities for this first number, right? Okay. In our second place, I'm going to rewrite all of our numbers because we sort of get an opportunity to use zero again. We couldn't use zero in the first one, but we can use it in this one. Um, someone's saying 27, so we'll, we'll keep that in mind too as we keep going. So this one we can use zero, but we can't repeat one that we've already used. So what's tricky is we don't know which number we necessarily used. But since we're doing these sequences, we can sort of arbitrarily choose any of them and just be like, hypothetically, if we had chose nine for the first one, or hypothetically, if we had chose one for the first one, it doesn't make a difference. The still, we have the same number of options, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine options for our second number. And then in our third option, we have six, seven, eight, nine. We are going to arbitrarily say, like, let's say we chose one, arbitrarily, let's say we chose two. The options that we have left are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have eight options. So let me explain these options one last time just to make sure we're all on the same page. There were nine the first time because out of our 10 digits, it could not be zero. The second time, out of our 10 digits, we can't be repeated. That's this part. And so whichever number we had chosen already, we couldn't use it again. But we are at, we started at 10 again because zero was an option again, but we moved it down to nine. And then in this final one, we have eight because we have 10 digits, two have already been used. So there's only eight left because we can't repeat them. Okay. So now we're going to do the same thing with letters. And we're going to start with any letter, right? There's no limit for what this one could be. So there's 26 letters in the alphabet. Awesome. And you know, if I wanted to, I could write them all out. I'm not going to because that'll take way too much time. But you know, I could write them all out and you could sort of decide or see it. Um, now we're on to the second letter. And our limit for this letter is that it can't be repeated. So instead of 26, how many options do we have for this second number? Does someone want to put it in the chat? Yep. 
Yes, exactly, 25. So we have one less option than the previous one. And then for this final one, we've already used up two letters, so now we only have 24 options. Exactly. And I am going to pull up the calculator on my phone because this is just going to be an absurdly large number. Times 26, times. <laughs> okay, if I multiplied correctly, which it's possible that I might have typed it in wrong, I think that this is how many possible passwords we have. I'll double check it one last time. Nine times nine times eight times 26 times 25 times 24. Yes, I got it twice, so feel confident. So that's a huge number of passwords, right? That's crazy. And let's think about it logically. Does this make sense for how many computer passwords there could be? Like someone asked before we really got into the problem if the answer was 30. Think about if 30 was the correct answer, only 30 people could sign into Google or only 30 people could have, I don't know, like an Instagram account or a Facebook account, right? That doesn't really make sense, but a huge number like this, this makes more sense. So a probability question that I could ask is like, if you log in five times before you get blocked from logging into some site that has these rules, these specific rules for the password, what are the odds that in those five attempts, you will correctly guess their password and you know, like hack into their account or something? And that sort of probability would look like this which is just a super small number, right? The odds of you being able to randomly guess someone's password is pretty low. But this one's definitely a stranger problem. So let me know if any of that didn't make sense. We like drew out the password and sort of thought through each specific step. And since it was a sequence of events, we multiplied. So our either we were adding a sequence of events were multiplying but that one is stranger, but you guys seem to follow that, which is good. This is a good one because it's kind of like the circle problem we did, but different. Um, what is the probability that if <laughs> you got in the account? <laughs> uh, that is a, a good comment. Um, okay. What is the probability that a point picked up random in the figure below will be in the shaded regions? We're going to sort of do the same thing. Gray out of not just the white, but of the like entire box. Um, so I'll, like entire, whole, uh, however you want to think about it. So how on earth do we figure out what the area of the hole is or the area of the gray. Maybe we can start with the hole um, because that's a good place to start. What usually is the area for a rectangle? You know, length times width. Before I even ask the question, someone was already saying, so what do we do when we don't have a length or a width here? We have like three separate numbers for each of these. What is the length and what is the width for these? Exactly, I heard someone say 10. So if that came to you naturally, awesome. If not, all we're doing is we're thinking about adding two plus six plus two because all of those pieces are making up this larger area. So 10 and 10, so our area for the big, it is a square, yeah. So our area for this big square, which we now know is a square, is 100. We still have not answered the gray area. Does anyone have a formula for the area of a cross shape or something that looks like an X? Probably not, right? Like that's not one of those things that you memorize, like half length times width for triangles or pi r squared for circles. This is not a shape that we use, right? But we can turn it in to shapes that we do know the answer to and add them up. So 
Can anyone figure out what the area of this shape is? Now it's a rectangle and it has a six and two. So what's the area of this? Twelve. And I saw that someone put another way of solving this problem, which I would love to jump into next. So we'll do that one next, but you are totally right. That that's another way to think about it. Um, okay, then we have this guy here, which is the same thing. So we have six times two is another 12. And then how about this really big guy here? Six times two plus six plus two, which is 10. So we have 60 here. So I could add those up and get 60 plus 12 plus 12 is 84. Um, so 84 out of 100 is our odd, or is our probability. So 84% or 0.84 or 42 over 50, which I can simplify further. You can see that I'm always, um, <laughs> I like try dividing by two and I'm like, oh, I can divide by two again. That's how I always simplify fractions. Um, so all of those are correct answers. Someone suggested that we do this instead, which is also a great way, sort of thinking about, we did either or problems and then we talked about neither nor problems. So a way of phrasing this is like, what is the probability that you neither land here or nor here, nor here, nor here. So we can figure out what the area of these teeny little squares are, which is four, and sort of add those up and do, you know, 4, 8, 12, 16, or 2 times 2 is what the square is, times 4, so 16, and we get 100 minus 16, which is also 84. So it's the same answer either way. But you guys seem to have a really good grasp on geometry, areas, how to use those in probability, which is exciting. Um, oh my. So you guys are on the right track, which is awesome. Okay. 30 students are asked if they play soccer or basketball. Every student plays at least one of the sports. 20 students said they play soccer and 15 said that they play basketball. How many students play both sports? So some important things. Every student plays some sport. So everyone has something, has some, some sport. We have 30 students total. We have 20 that are doing soccer and 15 that are doing basketball. So I'm looking at this problem and I'm like, huh, something's not adding up. 20 plus 15, that's 35. And we only interviewed 30 students. So um, exactly, someone already jumped there, five out of 30. So this is a problem that you probably either immediately Got, like you read through it and you're like, obviously there's a difference between 35 and 30. That difference is five people. So five people must have said that they play both soccer and basketball. And so this is a great example of a problem that if it's coming naturally to you, that is awesome. That means that you are thinking about things logically. You're taking your time to go through it slowly. And this logical or probable way of thinking is something that you're gaining a lot of confidence in, which is awesome. Um, if it did not come to you naturally, like do not stress, it will with the more practice. And another way you can sort of picture it as if you needed to is like almost drawing it out. I wouldn't recommend doing that because there's 30 students here, but um, you would sort of see that there has to be some sort of overlap in them. But you guys seem to have a good handle on this one. So I will not dwell. You guys crushed it very immediately. Okay. Um, another password problem. So a password is made up of two letters followed by two single digit numbers. If a person is assigned a password at random, what is the probability to the nearest hundredth that the password uses only even digits for the numbers? Okay, so um, what is the probability tells us that it's gonna be either like a fraction, percentage, or decimal. So we're, we are getting a probability. Our last password problem was just a how many. So we were just creating the list of possible passwords, which is why we got like, I can't even figure out that is 10,108,800. Um, but here we're dealing with a probability question. Um, so for probability, we want something specific, which in this case will be only sevens. 
over something more general. Um, so let's start by trying to figure out what this general is. And to figure out the general, that's a how many question. How many are the total number of possible passwords? So we're going to use the same logic that we used for the last one. So it has two letters, and then it has two single digit numbers. Um, there's no restrictions on repeating things like our last problem. So I'm thinking about passwords are a sequence of events, like they follow an order. So I'm thinking that I'm going to be multiplying these four numbers to get our total how many. What should this first number be? How many options do we have for letters? Twenty-six, right? It could be A, it could be B, it could be C, it could be D. I could keep on listing them. There's no restrictions here other than the fact that it has to be a letter. Um, how about this second letter? What should we put here? 26, 25, 10, 9? Does someone want to put it in the chat what the second number should be? Yes. 26 again. So in the last problem, we were doing 25 because we couldn't repeat. But this time, um, we can repeat. There's no restriction on that. So it's kind of like pulling a marble out and then putting it back in the bag and pulling out another marble. It's um, one of those problems where like, the coin doesn't care if it's been flipped over head, 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 head. It's still a 50-50 chance if it's going to be heads, tails. Um, so then we have single digit numbers. And this one, I always am like, is it nine or is it 10? Is it nine or is it 10? So if that is you, you can easily write it out really quickly um, and sort of just remind yourself that one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, it's 10. Don't forget the zero. Um, and hopefully you'll get to a place where you can just know that. But if you're not there yet, there's no shame in just like, I'm just going to quickly write it down and remind myself if there's 10 digits or nine digits. Um, and then for the second one, still no restriction. So it's 10 again. So I'm going to pull out my phone again um, to calculate it because, again, I have a feeling it's going to be big. 26 times 26 times 10 times 10. 67,600. Those are our total number of possibilities in this problem. Yes, so the restrictions are um, in, when we're talking about this general one, there are no restrictions at all to it because the passwords could be any number, but you're right in this next problem when we're looking for our specific answer, our restrictions are going to be that they have to be even numbers. So I'm gonna set up the password again. And now here is our like specific case of even numbers. I'm also realizing, did I accidentally type sub or did I write seven instead of evens? Yes, I did. <laughs> only evens. So now we have some restrictions. Does that make sense? The restrictions are not on every single possible case. We're applying restrictions to our specific case. As opposed to the last problem, the like password making site had general restrictions. Like you can't start with a zero, which is why that was different um, than this one. Okay, so now we're doing our specific event, which is that there are evens. Awesome, I see it 26 times 26. Those are our letters, those stay the same, and then five times five, exactly. So if you're like, oh my gosh, how did we choose five? Um, we can sort of go here and think about eight. Uh, let's see if I can do this correctly. Eight is even, six is even, four is even, two is even, zero is even. Um, and there you have it. So 26 times 26 times 5 times 5. I will pull up my calculator again. Times 5 times. I think I did that right. 26. Yeah, I did. Okay, 26 times 26 times 5 times 5. There we go. 16,900 is our possible cases. Before I do the math and like divide this out and I'll get 
something to the nearest hundredth. Um, let's like make a logical prediction. Do we think that it is very likely that you'll choose only even digits? Do we think it's about 50-50? Do we think it's less than 50-50? Do we think it's gonna be like super duper rare that you get two even digits? What do people think in the chat? Um, if it's useful, you can do like one as, I can't remember how we did it yesterday, but one as like search, no, I think one was impossible um, and five was certain, so like three. So three, someone's saying about 50-50. Does anyone else feel either way that it should be closer to two, closer to four? Okay, I see some twos. Does someone who um, said two want to say why they thought two instead of three? And I realize I might be putting you on the spot, so it's okay if you do not want to. Um, I think it is going to be closer to two. And the reason that, yes, okay, so someone's looking at the math already, which is good, but what if we did our math wrong? Um, we're trying to make a logical prediction sort of outside of looking at the math, um, just as a check so that once we're done with the math, we can say like, yes, that does make sense. So the reason it's closer to two is if you think about it, the odds of you having some password where there's one number and that one number is even, that's 50-50, that's three. But the odds of you having two numbers and both of those numbers are even, all of a sudden that's a little bit like spookier, you know, like um, it's no longer 50-50. All of a sudden it's 50-50 on that first time and then it's 50-50 on that second time. So it should be even less. Or if you had a password that had, for example, a hundred numbers and uh, it was asking what's the probability that all a hundred are even it's way less than 50 percent because you have to do 50 percent times 50 percent times 50 percent times 50 percent um and like that makes sense like if you saw a password that was like two four two four four two six eight eight four two you'd be like oh my goodness why are there no one three five sevens nines um, exactly, someone put an exploding brain emoji in the chat. That should feel a little bit stranger to you. Um, so the same idea is here. It's not like I'm expecting a super duper small number because it is only two numbers, but it should be less than 50-50 because it is pretty remarkable. Like I remember my locker combination for uh, my middle school locker was 27, 17, seven. So it's not like that crazy or that absurd, but the odds of having a repeated number, um, it's like just enough that it made me feel a little bit special that 27, 17, seven. We can actually, if we wanted to um, come up with the probability of that, but maybe that would be, boring um but if we have time we can turn back to it or if people are really invested in my middle school locker combination i can we can like look at the probability and i'll probably be heartbroken at the end and realize that it's not as special as i thought it was because in my head i was like this is so special um but it's not that special to have just two numbers that sort of repeat it but if it was like 27, 17, 7, 7, 7, 27, 17, 7, and it was really long, that would be much more impressive. So long story short, we're thinking this should be less than 50%. As Matthew pointed out really nicely already, just without even doing the division, it looks like we're in a good place because this does look like less than, um, it does look like it's less than 50%. Uh, and I can do it on my calculator here, but the answer is 25% or one out of four or 0.25, which should make sense because if you think about it, what we're doing in these fractions are, we have our specific event, which is 26 times 26 times five times five over 26 times 26 times 10 times 10. And we know how fractions work. We can sort of cancel out these similar things because we're multiplying. And then we have five divided by 10 is one half times five divided by 10 is one half. So one fourth is the correct answer here. So 
we like did all this long math and I had to plug it into you know my phone trying to go out all the way but um it should make sense that it's 25 percent because it's 50 percent times 50 percent is the chance okay that was a good problem here's another one there are 10 orange sodas 15 cream sodas and seven cherry sodas in an ice chest. How many sodas must be removed from the ice chest to guarantee that one of each type of soda has been chosen? I like this one because there's no real formula for how to think about this, right? Like I haven't, um, you know, told you, like when you see a problem like this, this is how you think about it. So it's all really your logic, thinking about it slowly. So we have, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten oranges in here. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen cream sodas and seven cherry. Oh, I just realized that I did. I'll call this one H. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so all this stuff in our ice box. I don't know, like I haven't given you a formula, but does anyone have any ideas of how I should start by thinking about this problem? Does anyone want to unmute themselves and throw an idea out there just to see how we feel? Maybe we'll start by like, let's start with a number like three, right? Because there's three different types of soda. What happens if we pull out three sodas randomly? Um, it could be three oranges. It could be two oranges and one cherry. It could be one cream and one cherry and one orange, which is what we want. We want three different types of soda. But as long as there is one possibility of it being not all three, that number's not big enough. So as long as there's one chance of us not getting all three, it doesn't work. So like we use three as an example, three too easily. If you randomly select three, it could have been three orange sodas or it could have been three cream sodas or it could have been seven cherry sodas. So how about a number like, maybe we can do five. If I pull out five, is there a chance that I could accidentally pull out not all three. Like I could pull out one orange, one orange, one orange, one orange, one orange. I forget how many I said already, but it, like, could I pull out five oranges? Yeah. How about 11, right? Because that's greater than 10 now. Is there a chance that if I pull out 11 sodas, I might not get all three or by 11? do I for sure have all three different types of sodas? What do we think? You can say yes if like 11 is large enough or no if 11 still there's a chance that I won't be getting all three types of soda. So yes, if you think 11 is the right answer, no, if you think we need to be pulling more than just 11 sodas to guarantee that we have different ones. I see a no, yes, right? Because what are the odds? You know, maybe they're low, but still you could pull out 11 cream sodas, for example, or you could pull out 10 orange sodas and one cream soda, right? That's no use. Um, so maybe now we can start using like the numbers in here. So, okay, that's a good idea. Like, let's just write that down. There's 32 sodas in, gen um, in total. That might be useful later on. And if not, um, it doesn't hurt to like have more information or be thinking about things differently. Maybe we can go through all of these numbers and sort of see what happens. So if I pull 16, am I guaranteed to have one orange, one cream, and one cherry? So 16 is half of 32, right? So I'm taking out half of this box, right? At this point, like I should be able to get one of each, right? But what if the third, what if the 16 that I grab happened to be Oops. Um, what if the 16 that I grab happened to be these 15 and one orange? 
not big enough, right? Because I'm not guaranteed to get um, all three types with 16. With 16, I can still, even if it's rare, I can still only get two of them. How about 18? Do we think 18, yes or no? I see a no, and you're totally right, because we could take 15 of our cream sodas and then um, I don't know how many we need. Two more? Wait, no, three more? Three more, and those could all be orange sodas, so still not large enough. What do people think about 23? Yes, that's the right answer, or no, still not large enough. Yes, another no, because you could grab 15 cream sodas. <laughs> no, 15 cream sodas and eight orange sodas, and we're still not getting any cherry sodas. What if all the cherry sodas are at the bottom? How about 25? Like at this point, 25. If not 25, what could it be? Is 25 high enough? What do you guys think? Still a no, and you're totally right. Um, 32 out of 32, not quite that high, but almost, because 25, you could grab 15 cream sodas and 10 orange sodas. Um, and the odds of that are like, maybe pretty low, but um, it could still happen. And this isn't asking us about probability, it's just asking how can we guarantee that we get one type of each soda? So the last answer is 26, exactly. And 26 works because in worst case scenario, we pull 10 orange sodas and then we immediately afterwards pull 15 cream sodas. But we're pulling 26 and all that'll be left in the box after we pull all of those are our cherry sodas. So if we pull 26, you'll get at least one cherry soda. So that was a good one too. Um, Okay, John buys a cake at a bakery and a hammer at a hardware store. If there are five hardware stores and three bakeries, in how many different combinations of stores can he purchase the cake and hammer? So this seems to me like I'm thinking about combinations. Um, so thinking about um, it being a series of events or a sequence of events, which means that we're multiplying. Our either or ones are where we make it more likely to happen. So like, just to scroll up and sort of see what we were talking about earlier, an example of it being more likely to happen with more things was like the baseball one. You know, you're more likely to have two options or you're more likely to fall under one option if you have two options. But when it's a combination, um, that's when it's getting more challenging. So that's why like a password with 10 even numbers, you're like, whoa, that's a little bit freakier. So basically combinations, we're thinking multiplying, not adding. Um, and our sequence are two different things. They're gonna have one place that's gonna be the um, hardware store and one place that's the bakery. So what are our options for hardware store? How many options do we have? Five, and how many options do we have for the bakery? Three, and it's asking us how many, so we don't even have to figure out the odds. It's just 15. So you guys seem to crush that one. So hopefully that these are getting easier and easier. Um, I think if we want to, Hmm. Maybe we'll start with <laughs> like the high five. We'll start with this one. Um, and then we'll decide if we want to do the target one and by looking at what time we have. Um, using, we do have a quiz today, so I'll send out the quiz at the end. Um, and it's more word problems, so hopefully you'll feel good in them. Using the diagram below, how many different ways can you get from point A to point C and then back to point A? So this is kind of like that tails and heads problem that we looked at at the beginning, where like there is a way to sort of mathematically think about it, um, and there is a formula, but since I didn't teach you the formula, instead we're gonna sort of have to sit through it, think through it slowly, and you'll still be able to get to the right answer. 
So we need to get from A to B, and then we need to get from B to C, and then we need to get from C to B, and then B to A. So we're gonna have four things. It's a sequence, so should I be adding or multiplying? Thinking multiplying, because it's a sequence. Sequence is like, again, like those passwords where it's like, if you're multiplying, it's like, oh my gosh, it's so crazy that they're all the same number. Um, so it's getting bigger. Um, it's a how many problem, so it's not gonna look like a fraction, it's just gonna look like a really big number. So when we're doing A to B, how many options do we have to get to A to B? Exactly four. We could take this one, this one, this one, this one. How about B to C? Awesome. And then we have a um, question of going to C to B. Close. Without repeating any paths. So let's say arbitrarily that we accidentally did this exactly four. And then what about for this final one, B to A? Three, exactly, because arbitrarily, I'm just selecting one randomly. And then you multiply it across, so 20 times 12. I just did those. I'm trying to do mental math. There's 240 different ways to get from A to B, or A to C and back to point A. Awesome. OK, I will let you guys decide in the chat um, for the final 10 minutes, how we want to spend it. One is I have this probability problem that is going to be fun, but as you can imagine, it's a lot of areas. So it's just cool to see how it pans out. Or the other one is I have a video that is kind of fun and I can share it with you. And then we can sort of look at the probability behind that video. What would you guys prefer to do video or target problem? So one vote for target. Target, awesome. I'll give it like one more minute to make sure that I'm not silencing a bunch of people who really want to do the video. Awesome, I love that everyone is so excited about this target. More experience, exactly. Um, yes, so this target problem <laughs> is, you're probably already thinking like, oh gosh, we're gonna have to use our areas, so. We've talked about it a couple times today. What's the area of a circle? Pi r squared. Um, the radius of the innermost circle is two. And the radius of each circle doubles as the circle gets bigger. So what's gonna be the radius of this circle here? Four. Four. How about the radius for this circle? Yes, eight and then for this last guy, 16. Okay, what is the probability that the dart will hit the shaded region to the nearest hundredth of a percentage? Okay, so we're thinking we need to do shaded over everything. Oh, that's not how you spell everything at all. Um, let's start with figuring out everything because that feels more accessible right now. Like we can do that. What is gonna be the area for everything? pi r squared, and what r are we using? 2, 4, 8, or 16 for our giant? 16, so that is 256 pi is 16 times 16. So now we have to be thinking about our shaded. So we're gonna take the big guy, subtract out the little guy, subtract out, hmm. okay, <laughs> let's, let's think about how we want to do this. Um, let's maybe break it up into two chunks, this chunk and this chunk. So for this first chunk, we want the big circle divided by this white circle. And then for this one, we'll do this circle, subtract out that circle, and we'll add up those two areas and that'll give us this ring and this ring together. Does that make sense for everyone? Can everyone see that or should I explain that more slowly?
Okay, I'm going to keep moving on, but if that doesn't make sense, or as we move through this, if you realize that was less straightforward, let me know. Um, so yes, I can explain it again. Someone messaged me privately. So to do this problem, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, it's kind of the same way that when we had like this problem, for example, and we thought about um, taking the big square um, and then subtracting out all of these areas, which we found the answer for. I'm thinking about the same thing with this one. We have um, this circle. So I'm going to start by finding the area of this big circle in the same way that I found the area of this whole square. And then I'm going to subtract out this entire inner circle. So I'm getting rid of all of this. So all I'll be finding the area of is just this gray shaded strip. But there's two gray shaded strips. So first I'm finding like big, big strip. And then the second one that I'm finding is this medium strip in the middle. And so how I'll do that one is I'll figure out the area of this. Oops, I'll find the area of this and subtract out that and that'll give us this little strip and we'll add up our big strip and our little strip together. So let's start by trying to figure out the area of this big strip. Um, someone asked me already for the answer and I honestly do not know off the top of my head. So once we're done, I will let you know. Um, so for the area of this, we have pi r squared. We already did that, so that's 256 pi um, for our big circle. And we're trying to subtract out this um, guy in the middle. So in the middle, we have, um, I'm using eight for this middle circle. Um, and that's 64 pi, pi r squared, eight times eight. So what I've done is I've taken the area of this really big circle and subtracted out all of this interior stuff. So now that's my answer for the big strip. And I could, you know, like subtract that out if I wanted to. And now you'll see that I'm slow with mental math. <laughs> um, there you go, 192 pi. Um, okay, now we have to do our little strip. So our little strip, we have this guy. Um, my drawing is getting more and more cluttered. Um, so what should be my pi r squared? What's my r for when I'm looking for this little strip? Is it 2, 4, 8, or 16? So it should be 4. So we have 16 pi is giving us the area of this whole circle. And now we have to subtract out this middle chunk. And to subtract out that middle chunk, we're doing pi r squared and our r is 2. So we should get 4 pi. So the area for this area is 12 pi. And like before we even go, that makes sense. There should be a greater area on the outside, smaller area on the inside. So I like, like where this is going. We have to add up our two strips, our big strip and our little strip to get our total. Um, so we have 192 plus 12 gives us 204. Um, so we have 204 pi over 256 pi. I'm looking at the time and hopefully we will be able to quickly finish this. I'm going to get rid of our pies and plug it into my calculator, which I have sitting before me. Um, I got 79.6875 or like 69%. Someone got very, very close to that number, but not quite. Do you see where you went wrong or did I possibly go wrong? Because I also might have gone wrong. Um, I'll let them sort of take their time to think through it. But 
even if I made a small little error, um, which hopefully I'll be able to tell you. Okay, someone subtracted too much. So this is the correct answer. But you did a great job tackling it on your own if you just jumped in and <laughs> tried to do it anyway. Um, but yes, that was a big problem. So good job to all of you guys for hanging in there. And also kudos to you guys for not wanting to just sit back and watch the video. And we do have a quiz and I'm pulling it out right now. And there it is. Um, yeah, so thank you guys for, for joining today. Um, let me know if you guys have any further questions. I have office hours today from one to three. Um, and then, yes, someone wanted yesterday's quiz. That's gonna take me a second to pull up, but I should be able to. Um, SAT intelligence, YouTube. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. You feel free to go as I'm working on trying to figure out the last week's quiz. Okay, and then this is yesterday's quiz. So hopefully that gets us all on the same page. Okay, thanks guys.